Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into some of the theory and some of the practical aspects of fine tuning the PID controller in your beta flight quad for the best possible flight response. This is quite a long video. There's lots of content to cover. I'm going to put timestamps down in the video description so you can skip to the bits most relevant to you. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. All right, welcome to the rabbit hole. In this video, we're going to be fine tuning our quad for the absolute best flight feel and responsiveness. Before we start this video, it's really important that you have understood and followed along with all of the steps in my previous tuning videos. So if you haven't done that, I'll put links to those in the video description. But if you have followed along with all the previous steps, let's get into fine tuning. The next thing we want to do is to enable and configure dynamic idle. So to do this, you're going to want to take your props off. Very important. Then go to the motors tab, connect a battery at storage voltage. So about 3.8 volts per cell. Enable the motors and set the motor drive to your idle throttle value. So your idle throttle value is found here on the configuration tab. It's 5.5% in this case. So you would set your motor drive to 1,055 for 5.5%. Look at the RPM number under the bar graph and divide that number by 100 and multiply by 0 0.8. So you're looking at 80% of that RPM and you're dividing by 100 because the dynamic idle value is multiplied by 100 RPM. Typically, you'll get something around 20, which is 2000 RPM for a five inch quad. If you have a different motor idle throttle value than five and a half percent, maybe you have six or six and a half percent, you want to set your motor drive to 1060 or 1065, for example. And again, divide the RPM number by 100 and multiply by 0 0.8. So what does dynamic idle do? Well, let's consider the situation where the flight controller needs to slow a motor down to its minimum possible speed as quickly as possible. Let's say maybe it's the end of a snap move and one of the motors needs to reduce to its minimum throttle level. Without dynamic idle, the flight controller just sends your minimum idle throttle value. So maybe five and a half percent by default and it just keeps sending five and a half percent. And the motor slows down and then we'll start to change RPM because it's getting a consistent five and a half percent throttle value, but its RPM will depend on the condition of the air that the prop is spinning in. So if you have very strong reverse flow, the prop RPM could actually dip down into a very low RPM area, which is a bit risky because it risks um, desyncs and it risks the motor not being able to accelerate the prop as quickly as we would like because it's spinning so slowly. If however we look at the situation where we have dynamic idle on, initially the flight controller does something different. It sends zero throttle and that actually helps the motor slow down more quickly because you can see that it's sending zero throttle rather than five and a half percent so the motor will slow down a little bit more quickly because of the, the lower throttle signal. So that's a benefit. And then once the motor hits the dynamic idle RPM value, the flight controller will boost the throttle up and maintain the correct amount of throttle, regardless of the um, inflow condition of the prop, to keep that RPM constant at the dynamic idle value. So you can see that the motor RPM doesn't do any of this dipping due to adverse flow. You just get a, an increase in the throttle position instead, which is much better. And that's going to make sure that the motor is much more responsive um, and able to spin up again quickly if it needs to. How do we tune that? How do we tune dynamic idle? Well, if your quad is not stable in the air at zero throttle, you should increase your motor idle throttle value. So maybe go up in steps of 
half or maybe 1%, but no more than that. And you shouldn't need more than 7% for most quads. I know some people run a little higher, 8 or 9%. Um, they typically are racers. But for freestyle, 7% is usually enough. Once you've changed this motor idle throttle value, go back into the motors tab and reset dynamic idle to 0 0.8 times the new idle RPM value. So uh, it's the same process as we talked about before. Go and connect a battery at 3.8 volts, set your motor output to 10. 65 or 1060 whatever the throttle value percent is and then look at the rpms divide by 100 multiply by 0 0.8 and that's your new dynamic idle value okay so before we dive into the theory of fine tuning the pid controller i wanted to make a small correction to this graph that i showed in my previous pid tuning video in that video i had derivative term acting on the pid error in fact, it acts on the gyro signal directly in recent versions of Betaflight. And that avoids having the derivative term spike up at the start of snap moves when the set point changes very, very quickly. It's a relatively small distinction and it doesn't affect anything else that I talked about in the video, but I thought I'd just make that correction anyway. When we're talking about fine tuning our PID controller, we're going to be thinking about the key ratios that affect the character of the PID controller's response. Because in my experience, the PID controller's response has more to do with the ratios between the terms than their absolute values. Typically, we want to have the highest absolute values of the gains that we can get. But it's the ratio between those gains that controls how the PID controller is responding. And this understanding, this theory, can really help us when we're tuning, because if we focus on these key ratios, we avoid changing multiple different characteristics of our PID controller at the same time. So we want to tune each of these three key ratios one by one. And if we do that, we'll avoid this nasty situation where we change one thing and we're actually affecting something else, and that can cause confusion. This approach will feel very familiar if you've watched my previous PID tuning video because it's exactly the same theory that we used in the first video. So here are the key ratios for PID controllers. The first is the PID noise sensitivity and this is governed by the D gain. And the D term is primarily responsible for amplifying any gyro noise that gets through your filter stages. And some gyro noise will always get through the filters. The D term amplifies this noise, and if your D gain is too high, it will cause oscillations and hot motors. So we want to find the maximum possible D gain, but not so much that we get oscillations or hot motors. We want to find the maximum comfortable amount of D gain. So that's the first key parameter that we want to control. The second key parameter is the step response of the PID controller. And that's to do with the ratio between the P gain and the D gain. This PD ratio controls the shape of the step response. So if we have a very large PD ratio, we get a response that oscillates and rings. And if we have a PD ratio that's too low, we get a response that's very sluggish and slow. And if we have the right PD ratio, we get a response like the red line, which is ideal. We get to the set point very, very quickly with no overshoot. And the final ratio is what I'm calling the I term wind up ratio. And this is to do with the ratio between the I gain and the P gain. And this IP ratio affects how I term winds up on fast moves. And this is a new concept for this video that I haven't talked about in my previous PID tuning video. So how does this help us when we're tuning? When we're tuning, we only want to change one of these characteristic ratios at a time, and we want to keep the other two ratios constant. And this minimizes the risk of accidentally breaking something while you're trying to fix something else and getting all tied up and confused. 
It also removes the need to circle back when you're tuning. The goal overall is to achieve gains high enough that mechanical factors like the power of your motors and the rate at which they can speed up becomes a limit for performance rather than the values in your PID controller. So let's start with the PID noise sensitivity. How can we change PID noise sensitivity without changing PD balance or IP balance and therefore potentially introducing confounding behaviors? Well, if we multiply P, I and D all by the same value, then the D gain increases. That gives us our, our increase in noise sensitivity that we're looking for. But our PD ratio and IP ratio stay the same as they were before, which is exactly what we want. And we can see that here by looking at the maths. So the D gain increases because we're multiplying it by a factor. I have picked 1.1 in this case. Our P gain is also increasing, but because both our P gain and our D gain are increasing by the same factor, the ratio of P to D stays the same because they cancel out. And the same is true of the I to P ratio. Both I gain and P gain are increasing by the same factor. So those two factors cancel each other out and the I P ratio stays the same. And this is why I recommend using the master slider to find your perfect D gain because when you use the master slider, you aren't affecting the PD ratio or the IP ratio. And so those characteristics of the PID controller are staying constant and therefore not going to cause any confounding effects that could confuse you. So how can we now change the PD balance or the PD ratio without changing the D gain or the PI balance well, if we multiply P and I by the same factor, then we find that PD ratio increases. We can see that here. We're multiplying P by 1.1, but D is staying the same, so the PD ratio is increasing. But the D gain is staying the same because we're not multiplying that by anything. And the IP ratio is also staying the same because we're multiplying I and P by the same value and that's cancelling out in the fraction, so the IP ratio is staying the same. And my understanding is that there will actually be a PI slider in Betaflight 4.3 to help you do this. Now, what about the IP balance? How can we change the IP balance without changing D gain or the PD balance, and therefore potentially introducing other factors? If we increase only the I term, then the IP ratio increases. You can see that I term increases, but P term stays the same. So IP ratio increases, but the D gain and the PD balance stay the same. And as far as I'm aware, this is currently only possible by manually adjusting the I term. So now that we have these three key ratios that we're tuning, you're going to be tuning each axis individually, roll, pitch, and yaw separately. You're going to need a piece of paper, a pen, and a calculator, or good mental multiplication. We're going to start by reducing feed forward on all axes to zero. Make sure you write down what the values were before so that you can put them back later. And in order to avoid chasing the dragon on this and getting really frustrated, I suggest to not bother making changes smaller than 5% or a multiplying factor of 1.05. So we're going to start by tuning our PID noise sensitivity, which is our D gain. And we're going to tune this by multiplying P, I and D by 1.05 or 1.1. And that's going to increase all the gains together whilst keeping those ratios the same as we want to. And we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep increasing by multiplying by 1.05 or 1.1 until our motors no longer sound smooth when we're flying smoothly. Don't worry if you get a little bit of oscillation, a little bit of warbling at high throttle, because we're going to fix that next. But you want your motors to be completely smooth while you're just cruising around. If you do start getting 
um, a little bit of oscillation or rough sounding motors decrease by dividing P, I and D by 1.05 or 1.1 to move those gains down. Once you have your maximum comfortable D gain just for cruising around, it's time to tune TPA or throttle PID attenuation. To do this, do some gradual ramps to full throttle and listen for any lack of smoothness from the motors. It can sometimes sound a little bit like a warbling sound. If you have warbling or a feel of oscillation at high throttle, but your motors are smooth in normal flight, then you need to tune TPA. So before we tune TPA, what does TPA actually do? Well, TPA reduces your PID gains at high throttle. And I've done a graph here to show you how it works. We're going from 1,000 or 0% throttle up to 2,000 or 100% throttle. And you can see that we start with our full 100% of our PID gains that you see in Beta Flight Configurator. So that's 100%. When you reach the TPA breakpoint, Beta Flight starts reducing your PID gains. And it does that gradually all the way down to whatever you set in TPA at full throttle. So if you have TPA set at 0 0.65, then your PID gains at full throttle will be 0 0.65 or 65% of your PID gains at zero throttle. And this is the TPA breakpoint. It indicates at what throttle level the PID gains will start to be reduced. So at this stage, it's set to 1,350 or 35% throttle. So that means that once you get to 35% throttle, if you go above that, that's when your gains will start to be gradually reduced. But below 35%, they're going to be at their full value that you had set in Beta Flight Configurator. So my recommendation for tuning TPA is to set your TPA breakpoint slightly above the throttle level that you use just for cruising around. For example, if you cruise between 30 and 40% throttle, set your TPA breakpoint to about 40%, which would be 1400. Then decrease TPA gradually until you eliminate warbling at high throttle. So the default is 0 0.65, maybe go down in steps of 0 0.05. So go down to 0 0.6 and then 0 0.55, 0 0.5, and keep going until you eliminate that warbling at high throttle. It's worth pointing out at this stage that the default TPA is usually fine for most builds. So if you're having to decrease your TPA value a lot, that points to a mechanical issue with your quad. So go back to step one and check over your mechanicals. Do you have uh, an antenna that's waggling around and causing a lot of vibration? Um, that's a classic one. Or do you have some other mechanical issue with your quad? The next step is to tune the PD balance. Now to tune the PD balance, we're going to be increasing our step response by multiplying P and I by 1.05 or 1.1. And we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep increasing it until we start seeing overshoot and bounce back at the end of snap moves in PID toolbox. So in my previous PID tuning video, I show you how to use PID toolbox. So you can go back and watch that again if you need to. But the idea is to keep increasing by multiplying P and I by 1.05 or 1.1 until you start seeing this kind of, let's say something like this brown line where you have this overshoot and then bounce back. If you do start seeing a response like this brown line or even worse, like this blue or green line, you need to decrease your step response, your PD balance by dividing P and I by 1.05 or 1.1. And the goal here is the red line, where you might have just the tiniest amount of overshoot, but you have no, no oscillation and no undershoot afterwards.
PID Toolbox is a great tool for, for seeing this because you can see the step response for your quad very clearly. And if you have something that looks like this graph in the lower right, um, that's pretty much perfect. And finally, we're going to look at tuning the IP balance. Now, in my experience, the integral term has quite a wide tuning window and the beta flight default IP balance is usually pretty OK. So I very rarely tune integral terms separately. Before changing this value, I would record your current value so that you can go back if you have any issues. And the goal again is to increase by multiplying I by 1.05 or 1.1 and to stop and go back if you start seeing I term oscillations in your logs. But in general, it's not a bad thing to have quite a lot of I term, particularly if your other gains are also very, very high because it will help keep your quad very, very stable at high speeds. A lot of the negative aspects of having a high amount of eye gain are mitigated by um, a feature in Betaflight called eye term relax, which prevents eye term accumulating on sharp moves. So let me try and explain why I think that high eye gains are a good thing. A lot of pilots worry that having eye gains that are too high might cause their quad to feel stiff and unresponsive. In fact, the opposite is more likely to be true. When you have a very large eye gain, it means that the eye term responds much more quickly. It winds up more quickly and it unwinds more quickly. And to show what that means, I've done these two graphs, one graph with a low eye gain and another with a high eye gain. And in this graph, you've got a quadcopter flying along straight and level, and it needs a certain amount of eye term to keep that nose steady. Then you flip inverted suddenly, and you need the same amount of eye term, but you need it in the opposite direction. If you have a low eye gain, then the eye term winds up very slowly to the required value. And then when you flip inverted, it unwinds slowly and winds up slowly in the other direction. And while it's winding up or unwinding and winding up in the other direction, that's when you can see wobbles and bobbles from your quad because you've not got the eye term at the right value to stabilize it. However, if you have a high eye gain, now the eye term winds up really fast, but notice that it doesn't wind up to a larger amount. The amount of eye term is the same as it was before. You're just getting there more quickly. And then when the eye term needs to unwind and wind up in the other direction, when you have a high eye gain, it can do that really fast. But again, it's important to note that the amount of eye term is the same in both cases. So increasing the eye gain hasn't changed the amount of eye term that's acting. It's just making it get there more quickly. And that, in most cases, is going to make the quad feel more locked in and responsive. One of the key challenges with having high eye term is that you can sometimes get an issue where the eye term can wind up or accumulate during fast stick moves when the gyro cannot track the set point. And then that high eye term can cause a bit of a wobble as it unwinds at the end of the fast move. Eye term relax in beta flight helps prevent this because it stops the eye term accumulating during fast stick moves. I would leave this a default in general because the default of 15 is pretty good for most quads. But if you find that your logs show that item is winding up to large values during fast moves, then you could consider reducing the cutoff to 12 or maybe 10. And that might help prevent um, the item winding up during those fast moves. Anti-gravity gain is really useful. It boosts the eye term on fast throttle changes. Now to tune anti-gravity gain, do lots of fast throttle pumps. So go from zero to 100 to zero to 100% throttle as quickly as you can. And look to see if the nose of your quad dips or rises as you pump the throttle. And if it does move around a lot as you pump the throttle, consider increasing the anti-gravity gain and see if that makes things better. Otherwise, I would suggest just leaving it at default because the default value is really good for most quads, particularly um, if the center of gravity of your quad is relatively central. 
if your center of gravity is not in the middle of your quad, then that's a, a time where you might need to increase anti-gravity gain to keep your nose steady on fast throttle changes. So now we're going to look at fine tuning feed forward. And the first thing to do is for you to put your original feed forward values back that you found in my first PID tuning video, because that's going to give you a good starting point when you start tuning each axis individually. And you're going to want to increase feed forward by multiplying the term by 1.05 or 1.1 and decrease by dividing by 1.05 or 1.1. Here's an example of too little feed forward. You can see that the gyro trace is lagging behind at both the start and the end of a sharp move. And this indicates that we need more feed forward. So you'd want to increase by multiplying by 1.05 or 1.1. Here's an example of what I would consider too much feed forward, but we'll come back to that because you can use dmin to manage overshoot at the end of a snap move. The gyro is following set point really well at the start of the move, but at the end of the move, you can see there's a big overshoot. So this is an example of um, perhaps too much feed forward, but as I said, we will come back and talk about how you might be able to tame this overshoot and still keep this really, really good stick tracking at the start of the move. But here's what I would consider the right amount of feed forward if you're not going to do anything with um, dmin to tame overshoots. So you can see there's a little bit of um, lag in the gyro. So the gyro lags a set point a little, but there's no overshoot at the end of a sharp move either. And so, um, it's kind of a good balance. And you've still got motor saturation at the end of the move, so the, the quad is still working as hard as it can to track set point. Okay, if you want to push feed forward even further and eliminate the last bit of pit error, you may need a way to tame the overshoot that you get at the end of snap moves. And this can be achieved by using dmin as a deboost to further increase the D term right here at the end of the snap move to tame this overshoot that's created by the feed forward. Honestly, I'm not sure this is necessary for most quads. I usually uh, am a little bit more conservative perhaps and try and find that balance between just a little bit of lag perhaps at the start of a snap move and then no overshoot at the end. Um, but we've come this far and so I'm going to show you how to do this you're going to need to set your black box logging mode to dmin for this. So first, let's try and understand how dmin works before we understand how to tune it. The dmin code boosts d in response to rapid changes in the gyro signal and also the set point, depending on how you have it tuned. The value boosts from dmin to dmax. So you set the two values in the configurator, dmin, which is the minimum d term, and dmax, which is the maximum d term you want it to boost to. With dmin logging and debug plots on in Black Box Explorer, which is trace template number six, we can see what's happening. So we have these factors. We have this red line, which is the gyro factor, and we have the green line, which is the set point factor. And you can see that the gyro factor is just a measure of the rate of change of the gyro signal. So it spikes up when the gyro is changing really fast. And the set point factor is a measure of the rate of change of the set point signal. And so you can see it spikes up when the set point is changing really fast. The set point factor is multiplied by the dmin advance value and is then added to the gyro factor. The total from that sum is then multiplied by the dmin gain parameter to give an amount of dboost to add to the d term. And dboost is capped so that the d term never exceeds dmax. And you can see that here. When we look at this actual d value, the yellow line, we can see that it boosts up with the gyro factor and then it caps at a certain level, which is the dmax. So how do we use dmin? Well, to start with, turn on dmin 
and set your dmin to the d value you've been using up until now. And then set your dmax to about 20% more than that. I would set your dmin advance to zero because we don't really want the dmin tracking set point changes when we're, when we're tuning it. And you're typically going to be focusing on the end of a snap move to tune in dmin to tame this overshoot. So this is the dmin setting and I would set the advance to zero. Now what you want to do is to check that your D term, which is this yellow line in the debug plot, is boosting up to its max value slightly before the gyro crosses the set point line and starts to overshoot. And you're going to want to increase D max until you have enough D term to tame this overshoot. If you need more D term, as in this D term spike isn't enough to tame the overshoot, then you need to increase your D max. And I would again, you know, multiply by 1.05 or 1.1 on that D max term to push it even higher. If, however, the D term is not boosting up to D max soon enough, so you're not hitting this flat line before the gyro crosses the set point then increase your dmin gain slightly so that it boosts up a bit sooner. You want to go carefully with dmin gain. I would move it up by a very small amount, you know, maybe one or two points at a time, because if you increase it too much, it will cause D to boost up all the time, and that can cause hot motors and oscillations. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you now feel like you have an even fuller understanding of some of the more advanced tools and techniques that Betaflight gives you to get your tune dialed in just the way you want it to be. If you like my work and would like to support me, please consider joining my Patreon. Patrons get access to my Discord server, which is a friendly place where you can discuss some of the more scientific aspects of FPV with myself and other like-minded pilots, and also get some extra advanced information of some of the new frame designs and other projects that I'm working on. Thanks very much for your time, and I wish you all very, very happy flying.